Hello everyone, it's Oscar at Virtual Factual here and this video is going to be serving the dual purpose of being the visual handout for the workshop I just taught at Neuchâtel in Switzerland as well as making a very important point about interpreting Leckhusen's fight book. Robert Brooks, who's one of the most knowledgeable fencers I know, has described working with Leckhusener as doing a PhD in Messer. And I think he's right, because just like when writing a doctoral thesis, there's no shortcuts and it takes a lot of time. Not to mention that you're going to have a hard time trying to explain the point of it all to your family over Christmas dinner. Look, all jokes aside, I think that a proper read-through of Leckhusener is very rewarding and can really help you develop your fencing skills, as long as you know what to look for. If you're watching this on YouTube and you're thinking about taking your first steps to interpreting Leckhusen's fight book or starting to fence with the long knife or Langes Messer in general, then this video is a really good place to begin. First, we must understand that techniques tend to recur over the course of the fight book in choreographed pieces called Stücke. And secondly, in order to understand these Stücke and be able to apply them in fencing, we must try to use both textual knowledge and embodied knowledge to try and understand the context and functions that they're used for. This is all a bit of a mouthful, so let's break this down first before we get started. Hans Leckhusner was a 15th century priest, and as such he received a university level education. That means that his teaching is inspired by the so-called scholastic method, which pretty much boils down to the notion that learning should be inductive, i.e. happen by going through as many examples as possible in order to internalize the core principles. This is a bit different from deductive learning, which is how most schools and universities work nowadays. The amount of theory in Leckhusen's fight book is rather minimal, with the bulk of this book actually being these choreographed Stücke, each exploring a different situation or possibility. They, in turn, are grouped into Hauptstücke, or principal pieces, each of which serves to fulfill a certain function or solve a problem you can encounter while fencing someone. A good example of the former would be, how should I initiate an attack against a fencer in a high guard? While an example of the latter would be, what to do when an opponent rushes in to grapple me. Working through the entire manuscript will therefore confront you with all the most likely situations you'll find yourself in while fencing with a long knife, or at least the ones that Leckhuner could think of. And this will force you to internalize rules and principles to apply in these situations. Sometimes the text will indicate what situation this piece applies to, and at other times we need to complement that text with embodied knowledge, which means that we must apply what physically makes sense to get to the starting point or the end result described in a piece. A good example would be this piece, where the opponent drops their knife in order to grab our knife hand. In itself, this is pretty pointless, but reasoning from what we could try to do from that position, we can reconstruct some sort of an intention. The opponent grabbing your hand will likely want to control your arm, potentially even applying an arm bar or manipulating your elbow. You could even learn a few of those examples in another part of the manuscript if you haven't paid attention. Now that we know why it's important to understand the context and the situations to which the Stücke apply, let's not despair at the ludicrous size of the fight book. Luckily for us, quite a few of the techniques or movement patterns apply to a wide range of different pieces. That means if you learn a technique from one piece, you can apply it in others as well. The workshop I told is an example of all of this, taking one technique from five different Stücke, giving us five different applications. So, let's begin. It all starts with a relatively simple movement pattern. Coming from the position called Eber, you load up by bringing the point to the ground and putting the thumb on the flat of your blade, effectively turning the messer in your hand by 90 degrees. From there, you cut a roughly horizontal cut, called the Entrusthau, or beleaguering cut, above your head with the blunt edge of the knife, followed by a step. After that, bring down the knife with a diagonal shoving motion and a step of the left foot almost as if you're trying to put the pommel or the grip into the right pocket of your trousers. And this is pretty much the only technique we'll be doing for the entire workshop. However, making small changes in footwork or uh, follow-ups based on the input that the opponent gives us will make the outcomes of the Stücke in which this technique features remarkably different though. The first piece is a simple application of the technique. It comes from the Hauptstück called Messernehmen, or Disarming. That name is somewhat deceptive though, because only a few of those Stücke actually end with you taking the other person's knife. The common theme is rather that these pieces allow you to definitively end a fight by neutralizing their weapon hands somehow. This could be a disarm, yes, but also a throw or a maiming cut to the hand. In this case, you shove the hand down. With the most commonly performed interpretation, you simultaneously shove the hand down and cut through the opponent's head. The text does state that you need to bring your hand up while cutting or slicing though, 
which indicates that you have to make a push cut rather than a draw cut. Although I can't be sure that this is the exact reason, I have found that this latter interpretation is interesting if you have a shorter messer, with which you could otherwise have trouble hitting the uh, opponent's head properly when shoving the hand down. I've tried both versions and both work quite well for me, even in sparring. The option where you cut straight away offers more control after you land the cut, but the downside is that it is less reliable against strong opponents. While shoving down the hand and then following up with a cut or slice with raised hand requires you to follow the opponent closely to remain safe from their knife, it is less reliant on strength. We move on. The second piece is interesting. Instead of just shoving the opponent's hand down, you now grab your blade in the middle and threaten their face with your point. This is called the gewappnet hand, or armed hand. Mechanically, this piece is the same as the previous one, until you go to the armed hand. It's interesting because performing the stück is slightly more difficult and risky than the previous one, because you have to get closer, and it's also more susceptible to being countered. It is, in short, not the most obvious way to go about things. This piece might be useful, though, when you don't want to necessarily kill the opponent, but just threaten them. Or it might be useful when fighting someone in armor. A cut or slice to the face is nothing to a fighter with a helmet but a thrust to the open face or to the visor slit is something else entirely. This idea is also supported by following pieces that involve a throw and a so-called murder stroke. So next, why anyone would want to try the third stick is not immediately clear. It feels somewhat convoluted and impractical, and it's largely because of pieces like this that Lekusner's fight book has gained a reputation for being too fancy. At first glance, this may appear to indeed be true, just going over the opponent's knife to clench it under your arm to trap it takes a lot more time than simply stabbing the opponent. But watch what happens when you try that and they step back. You're suddenly very vulnerable. Unless you try to put the pommel of your knife in your pocket, thereby clenching their messer. From there, to make sure they don't jerk it out, you have to go under their arm. Grabbing your own messer in Gwatnet Hand will then allow you to press the attack with your point again. Looking at the fourth piece is also pretty weird when just viewed in isolation. The piece itself is pretty simple to execute. If someone drops their knife to grab your hand, you simply find the exact right moment to try and put the pommel of your messer into your pocket. In doing so, your hand comes free and you will likely cut the opponent through their face. But why would anyone drop their knife like that? I did already talk about this example a while back though. If someone wants to set up an armbar, it's often easiest to just let go of your knife to be able to grab the arm with both your hands. Performing the armbar will require you to step in though, so to get your body behind it. If you're practicing this piece as a counter to the armbar, it's important to make that input realistic. The patient of the exercise can't just stand around, even though nothing more is described in the text. They have to not only grab your hand, but also take that step forward to where they would perform the armbar. If you time your counter well, you should still have no problem at all to make this work in this situation. The fifth and final stück is another example of the importance of reading text and then substituting missing information with embodied knowledge. This piece is part of the Hauptstück called Durchlaufen, or running through. The idea here is that if someone wants to wrestle with you, which is Einlaufen, you wrestle with them first, Durchlaufen. By disrupting their structure while they run into you, you effectively make them trip themselves up. You can amplify this effect by keeping up the forward momentum, which is to run them through in. In this case, if they press down onto your messer while running in so their hand comes low, you put your pommel towards your right pocket and bring your empty hand to their elbow, jerking it to your right. At the same time, you plant your left foot in front of their right foot before they can put it down. So their arm gets jerked in one direction while their hip gets bound back on yours towards another direction. The result, if combined with enough momentum from the patient, is a very nice face plant. As with the previous stück, it's important that the input gotten from the opponent of this particular stück is also informed by embodied knowledge. Simply following the text, they just run into you, but what does that mean? So you have to try and figure out what do they try to achieve? Do they try to just grab you or do they try to actually rush into you and try to grab you and bowl you over? In the latter case, this technique will work a lot better, which is probably uh, what they should be doing. Then you learn to recognize that situation, someone's really trying to rush you, and then you know that this is the situation in which you can apply this particular piece. While we're on the topic of realistic input and making different contexts work for you, let's use this idea of embodied knowledge to make your practice more realistic. 
You might want to ask yourself the question how most people would react if you were to perform an entrust how towards their head and then lean in and try to wrestle them down. You probably, like me, come to the conclusion that most people will simply just run back. This is unfortunate, because this way a lot of exchanges get super messy. That is, if you commit to performing the technique anyway, but you're in the wrong distance, it is very difficult to stay safe, so a lot of double hits occur there. But it doesn't have to be this way. A person running back is generally slower than a person running forward. So if you cut the entry style and they run back, just keep contact with their knife and follow them until you feel secure that you've gotten close enough to perform the technique you had in mind. You have the conscious choice of either cutting or slicing them for the face or going for the gewappnet hand to thrust. If this all goes well within this drill, you can add a bit more input to it. If you commit to shoving down the hand and your partner suddenly goes back faster, you can do a go over as we discussed in the third piece. If they drop the knife and attempt to put an armbar on you, then just reverse your footwork by stepping your right back instead of the left foot forward. And if they suddenly reverse direction and come forward, you run them through. Rinse and repeat until you can pull it off in free play. So, I hope this all makes sense. Technically and mechanically, this is all pretty simple and this is how it should be. Fencing with a Langes Messer was never meant to be complicated, but trying to teach a complete system through the scholastic method makes for a big fight book, as evidenced by Le Cusner's huge tome of Messer pieces. For a modern audience, using it to learn how to fight is a daunting task. Therefore, try to look for where these Stücke intersect with one another, and then use embodied knowledge to figure out how, where and when to do them. Doing this will allow you to internalize core principles as intended, and in doing that, you allow yourself to build a very well-grounded understanding of fencing. So, we're very nearly at the end of this video, and personally I think that this is one of the more important topics that I've ever tackled on here. I hope I managed to do it justice, I hope I managed to explain it simply and usefully without selling the source material short. Let me know in the comments what you think, and of course leave your questions there as well, I'll try to answer them within a reasonable amount of time. Now, before we all go, uh, don't forget to support the channel if you enjoyed this video by leaving a like, a comment, or sharing this with a friend, and subscribing if you haven't already. And if you feel that my videos recently have gotten better in quality, well that's mostly down to the support I get from all the amazing people over at Patreon because they allow me to invest in equipment and time to make these videos just that little bit more slick and professional than they used to be. Anyway, I hope to see you all for the next one, and until then, okay, do it.